invitation uh, for coming here today. Uh, I'm Pablo Alcantarilla, and I'm working on Toshiba Research Europe in, in Cambridge. So I joined uh, the Computer Vision Group uh, like half January. So I've been in the UK just about uh, seven months, more or less. Uh, who in this room knows uh, available features about uh, the type of descriptors? Is any of you familiar? Okay, so there are a few hands. Uh, that'll be good. Uh, I'm going to, this is going to be more like a seminar. I'm going to review uh, <coughs> like main methods in the history of feature detection and description. I'm going to show uh, how do we evaluate uh, feature detectors and descriptors. I'm going to show some applications and then I'm going to introduce uh, some features uh, that they operate in nonlinear scale spaces. Uh, so first I start by trying to answer this question, what is a, what is a local feature? So we go to Wikipedia, uh, feature is a piece of information which is relevant for solving the computational task related to certain application. Uh, that's very generic to me, so I prefer this definition, like a feature is in a specific 2D structure in the image, this is going to be a block corner or an edge that can be described in a local neighborhood by, by its appearing information. So when, we, when I talk about features, normally we are interested in these green circles that you can see in these images. So those are points of interest in the images that are uh, repeatable after different viewpoints of the, of the same object. Uh, when we talk about features, normally we have two steps. One is the detection and the second one is the description. So in the detection, what we are interested in finding points of interest that are going to be repeatable because we may have transformations in our image, we may have uh, blue, rotation, changes in viewpoint, or uh, compression. And in the description part, for each of these circles here, we want to compute an appearance descriptor that is going to be uh, dis discriminative, discriminative enough, so we can match <coughs> efficiently images uh, that have uh, different views or different transformations. Uh, local features are very important in, in many fields, in computer vision, in robotics, and also medical imaging. Uh, one of the reasons why features are so important nowadays is because basically we can compress the content of a whole image just by using a set of key points and uh, their appearing descriptors. Um, there are many applications for local features nowadays, such as structure for motion and the recognition, like better recognition and many more. We are going to see uh, some examples uh, in a few minutes. And it's also a widely studied problem in computer vision uh, since 20 or 30 years ago. And now we have many different methods and also we have great names. Uh, some of the most popular features are here, so we can have Surf, LDB, Dali, Fast, uh, Freak, Casse, and possibly the most important one is SIFT. Uh, SIFT really was a uh, super contribution in computer vision and SIFT opened all these uh, different applications that I'm going to talk about and motivated the research on, on novel feature detectors and descriptors. Uh, now we'll review some applications of literature. This is a structure from motion. In, uh, in a structure from motion, imagine that we have a photo collection of, of a monument. For example, here we have a photo collection of the St. Peter's Basilica in Vatican City. So, for each of these features, we are going to detect a set of, uh, set of, uh, set of features. We are going to compute the descriptors. We are going to match the descriptors between the different images. Uh, by means of, we are going to estimate the bipolar geometry. We are going to recover the motion of the cameras and also the structure of the scene. Uh, you will see this video. They share common objects, so by uh, matching the descriptors between those images, we are able to estimate a sparse 3D geometry of the scene. 
uh, and also uh, these uh, green and sometimes red, these are the camera positions we recover. This is a data set from, from Microsoft, the San Pedro Basilica data set, and I was doing a collaboration with Kaimi, now in Baidu, um, we use this data set while he was working on Microsoft. Another related application is uh, the stereo lens uh, visual as map or visual simultaneous localization and mapping. Here, the problem is that we have a stereo pair. We have a, a, a stereo pair mounted in a vehicle that is continuously moving in the scene. Uh, we are going to detect features, but we have two uh, matching scenarios. Then we, first, we have the, the stereo, so we have to detect features in the left image and the right image. And we have to match them and to obtain a set of 3D plots. And also, we have uh, temporal matching between frames in time. So, by matching the, the features that we have at this time instant and this time instant, we can solve nonlinear least squares problem and we can estimate the camera motion here. Then, given the camera motion and the disparate information, we can. Uh, we can do dense stereo matching to compute a dense disparity map, and then we are fusing those disparity maps incrementally. So this is uh, one example. This is, for example, uh, red here is the ground truth of the one sequence. Um, in blue is the estimation by means of visual odometry. Then we can optimize that trajectory, and this is one example of the of the dense reading models that we can obtain. This is one example from the Kitty data set. Now you're going to see uh, the set of images from the left camera that was mounted on the vehicle. And as each frame, we process each stereo frame, we compute the relative camera motion and produce the dense disparity matching and then fuse that information. So now, uh, this is a view of the reconstructed 3D point cloud that, that we recover in, in this sequence. So this sequence uh, may have millions of 3D points, um, and some parts, especially uh, those texture regions, are recovered with, with great detail, like some of the cars or some parts of the buildings. Of course, there are some problems with uh, the dense matching in, in textureless regions or regions that you, you do not have enough details. But uh, we can obtain uh, nice and accurate representations of the, of the 3D world <coughs> by means of, of them this on the plan. Another application of interest using features is place recognition. So imagine that we have a prior database uh, of a set of features that uh, it, it, we are going to have a set of locations and each location is going to be represented by a set of features. Uh, in this work, in the FAP map, they use the back of visual words approach. Uh, from the set of descriptors, they run a quanti quantization and then you have a, kind of like a visual vocabulary. Then by means of that visual vocabulary and a probabilistic model, uh, you can identify you have a robot that is going around a previous scene that you have in your map. You can identify if that image, is, that image comes from a new location or, or is the loop closure problem or is a location that is already in the map. So let's see one example here. Uh, so these are the, the images from the robot. And this yellow circle of the feature that the robot is, is seeing. And these are the, here we have like a loop closure probability. And then when we have a loop closure, it's like here we can see the kind of like the closest images in our database that the system has identified. And all of this uh, is working thanks to, to the use of these features. Another application is augmented reality. Uh, in this case, for example, regulatory recognition in this work from Pilar Sato. So they have uh, 
set of postcards in a database. Um, for each postcard, they have uh, they have a set of, of features, and then given a new query image, they are going to do the registration between the the object in the image and the objects in the database based on the features. And now they have the registration with the database. They can perform uh, these kind of uh, augmentations in the in the postcards. And all of this, uh, you can do this nice augmentation because you have the registration thanks to the features between your uh, query image and your database of images. Another example about object recognition, uh, but this is where we may have a deformable object in the image. Uh, here in this work, we have a database of the formable objects, and for each object, we have a set of uh, features, and also we have a, uh, a template about the 3D shape of the object. So here, the problem is giving a, a query image with an object of interest. We need to perform the non-rigid registration between your query image and our objects in the database. So we perform the registration in 2D. And at the same time, since we have a geometric template, we are going to estimate the deformable 3D surface here. So here, for example, uh, the user is waving a Spider-Man flag. So the system is computing features, then that's the registration between the query image and our object database. And here you can see uh, the estimated uh, 3D surface. And once we have the normal registration, we can perform like uh, augmentation, like for example here, we can render a movie, the amazing Spider-Man movie in the flat. So, um, those examples were asked to, to, to stand out that features are very important in, in, in many fields, in robotics, uh, computer vision, and augmented reality. And now we'll uh, just review most, some of the most important methods in, in feature detection and description. The first one is a uh, high risk corner detector. A corner is basically a point in your image where you have two dominant and different directions in a local neighborhood of the point. And you have this kind of measure of corner response. So you have to compute this uh, matrix A. Um, here are the first order derivatives in the x and y direction. And here uh, you sum the, the, these products over a local neighborhood. This can be uh, 5 by 5 pixels, 7 by 7 pixels. Um, so we have a corner response here, which is equals to the determinant of this matrix M minus a K, which is a empirical constant, multiplied by the trace of the matrix to the power of 2. Um, at the end, what you have is kind of uh, these yellow points here. Those are corners uh, detected by, by the Harris corner detector in those images. Harris is a very classical method, but it, it works quite well, quite well, in my opinion. Uh, more novel method is fast corner detector. Um, since its name is fast, so, so this algorithm is supposed to be really, really fast. Uh, it detects corners in a very fast way, and the idea is using segment tests. So what is a segment test? So imagine that we have uh, an area here in the image, so for a given pixel, we are going to check in this neighborhood if we have a set of n contiguous pixels in the circle, which are all brighter or darker than the intensity candidate here, plus a, plus a threshold T. So if we have this kind of situation, FAST is going to, to, uh, to say that this point here uh, corresponds to a corner. And by, by using this idea of segment tests, uh, you can detect corners in the image in a very fast way. Um, we have seen Harris and FAST, uh, but there are some problems. Uh, or, or drawbacks. Uh, does anyone know about which kind of problems the detectors may have? Some intuition? <laughs> no? Okay, so I will, I will tell you. So the problem is that high reason fast, they are not scaling variant detectors. 
since the size of the local neighborhood is a fixed parameter. So why do we need multi-scale uh, feature detection methods? Well, look at these images, for example. Um, what do we want to detect? Do we want to detect the whole shape of the tree, or a small detail in the window, or the whole window, or here the, the, the whole building? So we need a kind of mathematical operators that will detect features in, in different uh, scales or resolutions. And that's why uh, multi-scale image processing is important. Um, so one way to uh, compute uh, multi-scale features, normally what people use is the Gaussian kernel, um, because the Gaussian kernel and its set of partial derivatives are possible as multi kernels for a scale space analysis. Uh, the Gaussian kernel is the simplest option, but it's not the only one uh, to build a scale space of an image. Um, how do we build a Gaussian scale space? So here L is the luminance of our input image. We are going to convolve that image with uh, Gaussian kernels of increasing the standard deviation. And we are going to obtain uh, this kind of a smooth image. And this is one example of uh, the mathematical expression of the Gaussian kernel, where sigma is the standard deviation of, of, or the width of the kernel. And this is one, uh, one picture of Gauss. Uh, when we build a scale space representation of an image, uh, normally one classical uh, approach is to use a Gaussian pyramid. So in the Gaussian pyramid, we are going to produce a stack of images which are weighted down using a Gaussian kernel and a scale down as well. So here each row represents an octave, and when we reach the end of octave is that we have double uh, the size of the standard deviation of the Gaussian kernel. So we can uh, downsample the image and uh, continue for this octave until we have like a very coarse details of the image. Here you have a picture of a 2D Gaussian kernel. Now I'll mention approaches that they basically rely on this idea of Gaussian scalar space. And, and let's just start with SIFT. In SIFT the image content is represented by a set of local features that are invariant to some transformations such as translation, rotation, and scale and other imaging parameters. SIF is going to detect the points using a difference of Gaussian approach. And for each detected key point, for example, uh, this kind of uh, square areas, SIF is going to compute a 120 dimensional descriptor that is based on, on gradient orientation histograms computed according to the dominant orientation. And SIF was introduced by David Love, I think, uh, 1999, maybe this is a journal version from uh, 2004, and this was like, a, like a, it really changed the, the feel of computer vision, I think. So this is how the detector works. So we, uh, in, in our Gaussian scale space, we are going to compute the difference between uh, these smooth images, and that's our difference of Gaussians, and then we are going to find maxima in different Gaussian response in a spatial and a scale coordinates. So basically, those positions in the image that they have a maxima in the different Gaussian response, SIF is going to say that those are points of interest and are going to be repeatable. Uh, the descriptor works, it's a 4x4 array of gradient orientation histograms and they are weighted by the magnitude of the, of the gradient. And we have eight orientations here. Um, so, possibly this, this is going to be one of the most important slides of, of, the, of the talk, I hope. Uh, SIF is one of the most highly cited papers in computer vision and possibly all engineering sciences. Uh, it was rejected like uh, several times. Uh, I don't know the exact number, maybe twice or three times. Uh, and look at the number of citations that, that it has. That was uh, like maybe months ago this year, so it has like 24,100 citations. And when, when I always get, sometimes I get papers rejected, most of the time I would say. And <laughs> when I get a paper rejected, I say, okay, well, I should try better and harder and, and maybe do it in next time. So it's like if you think you have a cool idea, never give up and, and believe in your cool work. Hopefully it will accept it. 
and someday you can get 24,000 citations. Why not? Uh, another approach uh, similar to, to SIF is SURF, but SURF was inspired by SIF, but they wanted to uh, do feature detection and description a bit faster than SIF. Uh, the key idea is using uh, 2D hard wavelets thanks to the integral images. So the integral image is a, a kind of representation of the image uh, where you accumulate the intensity values uh, per, per row. And if you have an integral image, you can compute in a very fast way these uh, box filters to compute your hardware with derivatives. Integral images, they were also used in a very successful way in the famous Viola and Jones uh, phase detector, for example. Um, the detector in SURF is approximately the, termi the terminal of the Hessian response, and here the descriptor is a 64 dimensional vector that just takes into account the sums of first order hardware web responses. Uh, SURF is also a very popular method these days. Uh, now people also they started thinking about computing more efficient descriptors and they started looking at binary descriptors. Uh, one of the most popular approaches that, that came first is uh, BRIEF, which is binary robust independent elementary features. And BRIEF is really, really simple. Uh, it's a binary descriptor that is based on pairwise intensity comparison. Since it's binary, it has lower storage requirements. It's very fast to compute and match. Uh, you compute the Hamming distance, or L1. And Hamming distance is extremely fast in some uh, computer architecture that they have a specific instruction for, for Hamming distance. And brief is not uh, rotation or scaling variant. So how does uh, brief work? So imagine that this is uh, one area of the image centered at a particular point. So we are going to have a set of random pairwise comparisons, and we are going to build our binary descriptors. So what brief is going to do for each of these a uh, set of random pairwise comparisons is going to perform a binary test. And a binary test is saying if the intensity of, uh, of one sample point here in my neighborhood is higher than the other, I'm going to add one to my binary descriptor, otherwise I'm going to add zero. And you repeat the same, uh, and you do n binary test, and at the end you have a binary descriptor of dimension n. So it's, uh, it's very simple. Uh, the problem of brief is that it's not rotation invariant and it's, it's also not, it's, it's not a scale invariant. So in 2011 there were two methods that came uh, to, to add the rotation and scale invariants to brief. And these methods are the first one is ORP, uh, which is basically using fast corner detector in a Gaussian pyramid. And then it's computing a dominant orientation per point of interest, and then it's computing kind of like a brief descriptor adapted to that dominant orientation and that uh, and that scale. And a similar idea is uh, BRISC, which is binary robust invariant and scalable key points. Uh, both words they, they came out in the same conference in ICSB 2011. Uh, so BRISC is using also kind of similar uh, fast detector in a pyramidal way to detect a set of key points, uh, compute the dominant orientation, and then build in the binary descriptor. The main difference here is that the set of pairwise comparisons, they are fixed, so they are predefined, and they are weighted by, uh, different, by the values of different Gaussian kernels. So that's the main difference with uh, brief, where the set of pairwise comparisons were random, and or the can be random or you, you can learn uh, the set of pairwise comparisons for which you want to build your descriptor. Then in 2012, in ISMAR, uh, it appeared LDB, uh, which LDB uses intensity and also adds uh, gradient pairwise comparisons. So you can increase your, the distinctiveness of the descriptor by using gradient pairwise comparison. And also it's a multi-resolution descriptor because so you have an image, you divide it into, into different, this is 3 by 3 grids, and also you divide it 2 by 2 and 4 by 4. So for each of these grids, you are going to compute the average of the intensity and the average of the gradient, and you are going to do your binary, binary comparisons between these uh, average grids. 
this, as I said, this is problem with LDB is uh, not rotation and it's not a scaling variant, but it can improve a bit on the on the performance of brick thanks to, to the to the gradient addition. Okay, now that we have seen some methods in the literature, now what is important also is how do we evaluate features, uh, which kind of benchmarks uh, we can use to, to evaluate those features, and how do we know if one algorithm is better than the other. So there are several ones in the literature. The kind of the classical one is the Oxford uh, benchmark from uh, uh, Miko Leipzig and, and Cordelia Smith. Um, in the outdoor benchmark, we can evaluate detectors and descriptors, and we have several data sets with several image transformations, like viewpoint, blur, compression, and illumination. So this is, for example, the first row is the bikes data set, where we have changes in, in blur that we cannot see very well here because the images are small. Uh, boat data set, um, viewpoint, this is uh, UVC, compression, etc. So for, for the first image of each sequence and the rest of the images in each sequence, uh, we have ground truth data uh, in the form of, of planar homographies. So given the ground truth data, we can detect features in the first image of the sequence and then evaluate our detector and descriptors uh, in the rest of the images thanks to the ground truth. Another evaluation uh, for local descriptors only is the, uh, this one uh, from uh, Brown, discriminant, discriminant Learning of Local Image Descriptors. And the interesting thing about this data set is that the local set of, of image patches, they are computed from 3D reconstructions. And we have a reconstruction of the Statue of Liberty, uh, not Fedan and half done. Uh, so this data set kind of captures more in detail the kind of variability that we may face when we deal with descriptors in uh, 3D reconstruction problems. Another uh, evaluation that I really like, in this case for uh, detectors, is the interesting interest points uh, by Henry Van Eyes um, from the University of Copenhagen, I think. So the good thing about this data set is that the data set is obtained with a robotic arm. So we have a very good precision and accurate estimation of the ground truth. And they have many different viewpoints, and also they have many different lighting conditions. And at the same time, also they capture 3D surface information from a, from a structural light scanner. So this is very complete uh, and interesting evaluation. Now, uh, recently in 2012, uh, Hainley introduced kind of an extension of the Oxford benchmark but also to evaluate the kind of like the novel uh, binary descriptors that appear in the, in the recent years. Okay, uh, now let's talk about what is matching. So when I talk about a descriptor, a descriptor is a vector of data. It can be flow data, it can be uh, binary data that contains local appearance information of a key point. So we have the vector-based descriptors of the flow base that can be uh, safe and source and the binary-based descriptor as we, as we have seen before. Uh, we need to define a distance or metric to match descriptors. Normally we use the Euclidean distance for vector-based descriptors or the Hamming distance or a one for binary-based descriptors. And when we match two descriptors, uh, we have different matching strategies to say if this is a correspondence or not. We can use the similarity distance, if the distance, that means if the distance between two descriptors is small than a predefined threshold, you are going to say uh, this may be a good cor correspondence. Or the nearest neighbor distance ratio matching that was introduced uh, by David Love uh, in, in the SIP paper, where you check the distance, that the distance ratio between the two closest neighbors of a, of a query descriptor is below, is below a certain value. Um, Imagine some applications we may have millions of descriptors, so we want matching to be kind of efficient. So sometimes the brute force approach, it can be very slow in some applications, so we may want to look at approximating nearest neighbors, for example. And there is a very good library for uh, this kind of problem, which is uh, FLAM. So if you have a large scale applications that require matching millions of descriptors, you may want to look into, into that kind of approximated nearest neighbor approaches. 
Uh, and I will mention about the kind of uh, repeatability score and, and recall and precision when we evaluate how good is our detector and our descriptor. Repeatability basically quantifies how repeatable our detector is. Recall quantifies how many of the possible correct matches were actually found. So this is equal to the number of correct matches divided by the number of correspondences. And precision defines, is kind of like a lie ratio, defines the number of correct matches out of the set of putative matches. Uh, the number of correspondences given here is given by our ground truth information. Um, to define a correspondence, uh, given ground truth, we can check that the, that the pixel error after the transformation is uh, below some, some value, like 2.5 pixels, for example. Or we can also check at the overlap error error. So the overlap error error is that we have uh, these two regions in the image. Given the ground truth, we project one of the regions into the other image. And we just measure the overlap between the areas of these two. Uh, so we compute the area intersection and the area union in, in, in the projected space. And if the uh, overlap area error is uh, very small, that you can say that, okay, uh, I'm confident that these two features may, may be a, a real correspondence. Okay, uh, now we've seen uh, several methods in the literature. We have seen applications, and we have seen how to evaluate uh, feature detectors and descriptors, at least briefly. Uh, so now we'll a star about uh, talking about nonlinear diffusion filtering and, and features that operate in nonlinear diffusion. Uh, most of the approaches we have seen that they use the Gaussian scalar space, as for example, SIFs compute the Gaussian scalar space or SURF approximates the, the Gaussian derivatives. And what's the problem of, of uh, Gaussian scalar space is that the Gaussian blurring does not respect the natural boundaries of objects and it smooths to the same degree details and, and noise at all scale levels. Um, the price to pay for this is a reduction in, in localization accuracy. So when I was thinking about this idea, I was thinking, why not making blurring locally adapted to the image data so that noise is smooth, but at the same time you preserve important of the boundaries. And the solution is uh, nonlinear diffusion filtering. And you will see why. So, this is one uh, image from the UBC sequence from the observed band map. So here, the left one is going to show the evolution of that image through the Gaussian scalar space. And the right one is going to show a uh, nonlinear diffusion filter. So as long as we increase time, we see that some details, I mean, in the Gaussian scalar space, uh, details and noise is completely smooth. And in the nonlinear diffusion filtering approach, we can see that we have preserved important of the boundaries. Um, for feature uh, detection and description, this really makes a difference because in mind what classical approaches they were trying to do, they were trying to localize a feature at, at this coarse uh, scale representation, and everything is blurred. So you may have loss in localization accuracy in your, since everything is, is blurred and it's very smooth, your descriptors probably they are less discriminative than in the nonlinear diffusion case. So here, for example, uh, we can have better localization in the window uh, in some features since important object boundaries are preserved. The localization of our uh, feature key points is going to be better and also the descriptor is going to be more discriminative because we are basically we are going to preserve more high frequency components in, in our descriptor. So now let's explain how nonlinear diffusion filtering works. Um, so basically, nonlinear diffusion approaches they describe the evolution of the luminance of an image. L is the luminance of an image through increasing in scale levels or, or time as the divergence of a flow function, this flow function C, that depends on the pixel position and also depends on the time or the scale level, uh, multiplied by the gradient, uh, the gradient of the of the image. So this function C depends on local uh, image differential the structure, uh, the structure of the image, and this can be this can be either a scalar or the 
that can be a tensor. Uh, in this talk, uh, all, all the things I'm going to show we were considering that this function c uh, returns a scalar. Um, yeah, the time t, the scale parameter, and larger values of t, they lead to a simple representation of the images. Uh, kind of the classical approach is Perron and Malik diffusion equation, which uh, is uh, being c being a function that depends on the gradient. And we want to reduce the diffusion at uh, edges location, encouraging a smoothing within a region instead of a smoothing across the boundaries. So, Perona and Malik in, his seminar, in their seminal work, they proposed two kind of conductive functions, V1 and, and V2. Uh, so they have this kind of form, and uh, we can see that they depend on the gradient, and they depend on a contrast factor parameter, K. Now we're going to see some examples. Uh, the contrast factor parameter, they, you can set it by hand or apply some learning. Uh, what we have found in practice is that we computed empirically as a 70, uh, 70 percentile of the gradient histogram of a smooth version of the original image. If the conductivity function C is constant, uh, we have a linear diffusion again. And this is another kind of this con uh, conductivity function proposed by uh, Joachim Weicker uh, that we I just mentioned because it, it's in the in, in the results. So this is E3. And this is the conductivity function in the Ferron and Malik equation. First row is for G1 and second row is for G2. And here you can see different values of the contrast factor parameter. So as long as we increase uh, K, uh, you can observe that only higher gradients are preserved. So we go, so low K, we preserve uh, most of the gradients, and as long as we increase K, uh, we just preserve the, the strongest gradients. Well, so the nonlinear diffusion equation, uh, that's an equation based on, on uh, it's a PDF, partial uh, differential equation, so the problem is there are no analytical solutions. Uh, for the PDS involved in nonlinear diffusion filtering. Uh, therefore, we need to use uh, numerical methods to approximate the solution for these PDEs. And the simplest discretization is to use the uh, explicit or forward Euler scheme. Uh, this is in matrix form, uh, which uh, this kind of matrix A, this uh, matrix A encodes the diffusivities of, of that particular image. Um, and the way we solve this kind of problems is uh, iterative approaches, and we have here tau, uh, which is a time step. Uh, here it's very easy to perform a single iteration, but the main problem of the explicit scheme is that the discretization is only converges if tau is, uh, is lower than 1 divided by uh, 2m, where m is equal to 2 for, for the case to the images. So that means that uh, we need uh, many iterations to reach a desired evolution level. Uh, and in mind, if we want to perform feature detection and description, and we need to come out with schemes that they perform many iterations, they are going to be uh, really slow. So this is not a very, very good um, option. But there are uh, better, alternative, better alternatives. And one is semi-implicit scheme using additive operator splitting and fast explicit diffusion. Um, I'm just going to, to go kind of very quickly for this uh, in these mathematical details. The semi-implicit scheme just changes a bit the discretization of the nonlinear diffusion equation by considering here the, the next uh, the, ne the, the next luminance in the scalar space, and you have a kind of similar iteration scheme, but you need to invert a matrix here for solving uh, this scheme. And the good thing is that the system matrix is diagonal, and you can do it efficiently by using the Thomas algorithm, which is a kind of Gaussian elimination algorithm for our tridiagonal systems. And the good news is that the system is a stable for any step size. So with a semi-implicit scheme, uh, we can uh, produce larger step sizes, and the solution will be stable. 
the additive operator splitting uh, comes here, so it's kind of the, it's a semi implicit scheme, but uh, we can sum the contributions of these diffusion processes for each dimension of our image. So first we do it, for example, for the rows, then for the columns, and then we sum the output of those uh, uh, AOS approaches, and we obtain the, the solution. And the good thing about uh, AOS is that they are easily parallel stable. Um, then in 2010 and 2013, the um, Justin Becker group and um, Sven Grevenich, they came with a fast explicit diffusion approach. Fast explicit diffusion uh, combines advantages of explicit and semi-implicit schemes and avoiding their shortcomings. Uh, fed schemes are motivated from a decomposition of both filters in terms of explicit schemes. Um, this picture basically resumes very well the idea of Fed. Uh, while in a, an explicit scheme we have the rabbit here, like the rabbit is doing very small jumps. In fast explicit diffusion, the rabbit does very large jumps, then short ones, then small jump, and big ones. Um, that means that we use kind of like a, Varying step sizes in fast explicit diffusion, that the, the values of these step sizes they come from the factorization of the of the box filters. Um, if you are more interested in the mathematical details, I encourage you to read these two works, because I think uh, this is a really good piece of work. Um, we have more good news for feature detection and description. Uh, FED is more accurate and faster than AOS. We can see here this example here by computing the relative mean absolute error. So we have this kind of problem. We have this original image and we want to perform nonlinear diffusion up to a certain time level and obtain this uh, filter image. So we, com we compute the reference solution R by using a split scheme with very small step sizes. And then uh, we compute the approximation with, uh, with FED and AOS. Um, here we can see the, the success the time versus the error. So what we can see here, the blue graph is for FED and the red one is for AOS. So the error of FED achieves a uh, lower error compared to AOS. And it's also much faster. So, that's very good in, in the case of feature detection and description that we are interested in, in very fast algorithms. Now let's talk about uh, CASE features. Uh, CASE features is uh, kind of like an algorithm that performs feature detection and description in nonlinear scale spaces using the idea of nonlinear diffusion filtering. And CASE is a Japanese word that means uh, wind. So here, if there is any Japanese speaker, this is the kanji of, of wind. Um, kind of the similarities that, well, wind is defined as a flow of air on large scale, and we said that this flow of air is ruled by nonlinear processes, and we made the kind of the analogy with uh, nonlinear diffusion filter in the image domain. And also, uh, the features are named Kase because uh, Taiso Yima is kind of like the father of the scalar space analysis, so it was kind of a, as a tribute to, to, to him. Uh, how does CASA work? Uh, so the first step, we need to build nonlinear scalar space of an image. Uh, CASA uses AOS, and we need to define a set of octaves and a set of sublevels for our scalar space. And these are going to be the uh, different sizes of the of the uh, of the kernels that we're going to use. Uh, this is kind of a uh, scale units. So nonlinear diffusion filtering is in terms of uh, time units. So we we use this mapping to map from scale units to time units. And this is the, the conversion that you will use in, in the Gaussian scale space. Uh, so in the case of nonlinear diffusion there is no exact mapping between uh, pixel size and time units, so we rely on the Gaussian scalar space approximation for that. So we are going to have a set of filter images in our nonlinear uh, scalar space, and in this scalar space we are going to look for uh, maximal responses of the determinant of the Hessian response. 
and performing on maxima suppression in a scale and, and in a scale and space in the image. So once we have detected a set of key points that they uh, show maximum response of the determinant of the Hessian, we are going to compute a set of derivatives for the descriptor. The derivatives are approximated by means of Schar filters. Uh, because Schar filters are well known to approximate better, uh, especially rotation invariance compared to other popular uh, derivative schemes. And then in the description for each detected key point, we estimate the dominant orientation. If we want the upright version, the upright version is you do not compute an orientation. This can be an application, for example, a car that the camera is fixed and it doesn't rotate. So you will get better performance if you compute the upright version of the descriptors. And then uh, we build the descriptor using the multi-scale derivatives. And the descriptor grid is, uh, looks similar as a modified source approach uh, presented in this paper, uh, sensory paper by Agrobal in 2008. But the main difference is that our set of derivatives are computed <coughs> from a nonlinear scalar space instead of using a hard wave approximations. So, this is kind of the descriptor. We will have a different set of regions with a certain overlap, and the contributions of each region is weighted by, by a Gaussian. Okay, uh, now let's uh, see kind of the results that we can obtain with uh, CASA features. So this is uh, the Oxford benchmark. Here you can see the matching between the key points in the first image, and I think this is maybe the fourth image. So the, the red lines, they just denote the set of thin layers in that image matching problem. This figure is a uh, repeatability score of the detector. Uh, interesting here, CASA variants with G1, G2, and G3, those are the different conductivity functions, are in this uh, kind of orange, yellow, and white. And other algorithms like uh, SURF is here in black, and SIFT is in uh, kind of brown, and the star, the star is kind of similar to, to SURF, so it's in red. So the main picture that at least in blurry, that we have like a big improvement in detect repeatability, sometimes even more than, than 20%. And this is the recall y minus precision for the joint method detector plus descriptor. And here our uh, cassette is performing here. Uh, for example, surf is, surf is here in black. So we also have a uh, big improvement in, in, in recall and precision. Uh, another case is, for example, this is a uh, change in zoom plus rotation. Here the transformation is a bit more difficult. But still, we have uh, some improvement. Uh, here in the recall, one minus precision, here other methods like SURF and see if they are performing slightly better. But the number of correspondences that the algorithms found, it's, uh, it's different. In the case of CASE, the number of correspondences that detected is, is higher. So uh, when the transformation is more difficult, uh, it's also the, the transformation more difficult, the descriptor, uh, the, it's more difficult to evaluate if you have a higher number of correspondences. Uh, this is changes in Gaussian noise. Again, uh, we have superior performance in detector repeatability and, and descriptor distinctiveness. Changes in lighting. Also, we have, uh, we have a nice improvement as well. Uh, this is compression. And this is one example of uh, image matching deformable surfaces. So here is kind of the, the application I presented with the deformable audit database. So here we have a query input image, and then we have a target image of the same audio but under a certain deformation. Um, so here we need to perform non-rigid uh, registration. And in this example, we use the deformable surface detection method of Pizarro and, and Bartoli that is based on local surface smoothness, even a set of, of putative matches, it will determine which ones are, are in layers based on local surface smoothness. Uh, so here is a, is a picture. We use nearest neighbor distance ratio to match the descriptors. And here you can see the number of in layers. So again, uh, all the cases with CASA under uh, the different conductivity functions, we obtain higher number of in layers compared to, to previous methods. 
Uh, this is kind of old time in evaluation that it was in uh, ECCB 2012. So CASA implementation is in C++ and it's based in OpenCV. And these are kind of the, the, the times that we got for uh, two images in kind of like a very uh, old laptop. Uh, like the big numbers is, for example, if you want to extract like 1,400 key points in this image, uh, CASA may spend uh, 2.2 seconds so 0.89 and save 2.66. So um, in this other image, uh, 2.66 for CASE uh, surf is very fast, so it's very small. And save is comparable to, to CASE. So kind of the main conclusions here is that CASE is slower than surf for a star, but it's kind of comparable to save. And now the, I mean, the implementation has improved and you can get uh, faster computation times. Uh, despite that it was kind of slower compared to SURF, uh, it was like a, a step forward in performance in both detection and description against previous methods. Uh, thanks to the nonlinear scale space, so we have improvements in repeatability of more than 20% with respect to, to other methods like surface star and 40% with respect to shift in some cases. And we also have improvements in recall of more than, than, than 40% uh, using the same number of key points. Um, also, we also have good results for the deformable case. Uh, now the question is, okay, uh, we released CASA in ECCB 2012, we were happy, we obtained good performance, but we wanted to, to do it a bit better and, and also faster. We, we wanted faster features that we can use in real-time demos or real-time applications. So that's why we came out last year with the accelerated CASA version that was presented in, in BMDC. So here uh, we speeded up the features and also added uh, binary descriptors. And under some circumstances, depending on the configuration, the image resolution, the number of octaves and so levels that you want to, to obtain in your nonlinear scale space, you can achieve real-time performance with these, these features. Um, the two key ideas of this method compared to CASA is the use of, of fast explicit diffusion embedded in a pyramidal approach to speed up the nonlinear scale space and also to use a binary, uh, modify local different binary descriptors. This is kind of the algorithmic, uh, algorithmic details of the pyramidal uh, fed approach that I'm going to skip. The MLDB descriptor, uh, it's similar to the LDB that we've seen before, but it's a scalar rotation invariant. Also, we don't use hard wavelengths for computing the descriptors. We compute the derivatives from the nonlinear scalar space. And we divide uh, a rectangular patch into different subgrids, and we are going to do sampling and sum the responses of those sampling points. And then we are going to do the pairwise comparisons uh, between those grids in intensity and gradient. Uh, the full length descriptor is going to be 486 bits, and we are going to use the three, channel, the three channels. By channels, I mean one is intensity, second channel is horizontal gradient, and the third channel is uh, vertical gradient. And the dimension can be reduced if, for example, you, we use randomly selection. So, like, you may want to, to select just a certain number of bits because the matching will be faster. Uh, the good news, these are some of the results. This is synthetic rotation. So here, uh, it's important to focus on the blue graph, which is a case. The red one is case. And I think the uh, source is black. Um, so it performs kind of really well. It's almost perfect against changes in rotation. This is a uh, compression. It's also really good. And it's performing a bit better than, than CASA. Uh, this is a data set and viewpoint. But again, we have an, an improvement in repeatability uh, with respect to CASA. Um, this is uh, precision and recall, precision versus the number of bits. So here we, we were matching the descriptors using random selection. So you can see here, this is the, the performance that you get using the whole uh, descriptor length. But if you reduce the dimension of the descriptor by using random selection, you can also get a uh, very good performance uh, using just a small fraction of the whole descriptor. 
and this is uh, precision versus number of bits for uh, one uh, the whole data set changes in viewpoint. And here, if you see these two graphs in, in red, this one is the performance that you get when you are using the three channels, so intensity plus gradients, with respect to using just uh, intensity. Um, and also the, the same comparison for uh, images one and four for the blue graphs. So you can see that uh, adding the, the, the gradients uh, pairwise comparison also helps to increase your performance. And this is kind of like the timing picture. Red is Kase, uh, this uh, light blue is it. And Akase is uh, this blue here, so somewhere here. And this is Surf, so it's, uh, it's faster than Surf, but it still is slower compared to this is uh, Orb and Brisk. Uh, so it's kind of in the middle, but we get very good performance, and, um, and the features are somehow fast, and they can perform also in real time in some applications. Uh, now I will just show you two videos to do the talk. Uh, so this first one is a comparison uh, with other with Brisk and Orb, uh, two other binary descriptors methods, in an object tracking experiment. So we use the nearest neighbor distant ratio matching criteria, and we estimate an homography, uh, planar homography, uh, using a RANSAC procedure then we will say that the good matches are those ones that they have a pixel error location smaller than 2.5 pixels. And this is a very challenging sequence because we, we have fast camera motion, we have blur, and also changes in viewpoint, rotation, and scale. So the first comparison is Akasa using 256 bits and Orb using 256 bits as well. So you will see here the first image of the video that we try to match to other images in the sequence. Uh, those lines here, they yeah, they know the, the in layers that Ransack found. So in general, you can see uh, both methods are using the same number of key points, approximately. So you can see that some methods, uh, for example, you can see it in the density of the number of in layers that Akasa is finding higher number of in layers compared to to or So for example, this case, this frame, Akasa is finding 268 and Orb is just finding uh, 15. So it's performing much, much better in, in this kind of object tracking problems. And this is kind of like the average uh, number of in layers and number of matches. So blue is Akase and, and, and yellow is Orb. So in this experiment, Akase is performing much better than Orb. And also, uh, we did the same comparison with uh, Brisk but increasing the dimension of Akasa to 486 bits. And in this sequence, we also get a similar conclusion that Akasa is performing very well. You have a lot of thin layers compared to other methods, and you can perform the, the object tracking in a, in a good way. Also, uh, this video here, um, they are not designed to medical applications, but we try to use Akasa in uh, medical applications. Medical application, medical imaging is a bit more difficult because you have the specularities, you have uh, deformations, so it's a bit more challenging than uh, photo collection where you can easily apply a particular geometry and things like that. <coughs> so here we compare Akasa. Uh, with risk in kind of a uh, uterus in intervention in surgery. So here, um, yeah, the surgeon is deforming the, uh, the uterus, the area of the surgery. And still we can find a uh, higher number of matches and in layers in Akasa uh, with respect to risk. Uh, and also we did the kind of the comparison with SIFT, uh, which SIFT is this kind of very robust uh, uh, detector and descriptor. And um, in the case of C, uh, we got uh, comparable results. It's slightly better for Akase, but the main difference here is that Akase is 486 bits and CIF is using 128 bytes. So CIF is using uh, far more, more information. But Akase is faster to, for, for matching. Um, these are some. Yeah, these are some 
some of the ratios of the matching results. These are the number of inliers, so yellow is a case, or purple is if, so um, surf is uh, green and yellow method, so we get higher number of inliers with a case, and also um, the same for the number of matches. Um, more good news, uh, this is open source code. The code is available under BSD license, so you can freely use it for commercial applications. And that's very good, that was my, my main goal when I was trying to develop these kind of algorithms because other methods such as surf and sieve, uh, they have patents, so it's more difficult to use in commercial applications. You may need to pay for a license. Uh, it's a C++ implementation based on OpenCV. Uh, last week we finished uh, Google Summer of Code. I was working with OpenCV uh, Foundation and with the students, so we integrated both methods into the OpenCV library. So now if you download the latest version of OpenCV, you will find those methods here. Um, also there are MATLAB wrappers available, and possibly in the future I would like to uh, develop GPU and mobile phone implementation of these algorithms. Also, you can check uh, the code, uh, go to my, my website, download the code here, or from my GitHub account, and send me an email if you have any, any questions or comments. Uh, okay, so these are the conclusions. So, we review main methods for 2D feature detection and description. Uh, if you are not so convinced, I would like to encourage you to use CASE. Anakase, they have good performance and they are free, so you don't need to pay me anything. I mean, if you want to pay me anything, it's, it's welcome, <laughs> but don't be forced. Um, we have seen also some applications of features, but there are many more applications that use uh, local features. Some feature directions, uh, still there, are room for, there is room for improvement to obtain more robust features and descriptors against difficult and challenging transformations, such as illumination, uh, day, night, or through seasons, uh, viewpoint, and also the case of the formable surfaces. And also the extension of some of the methods to 3D data, where uh, still uh, feature detectors and descriptor are, are not as, as mature as in the 2D domain. And in the next future, 3D is going to be everywhere, because we are going to have the cameras in our mobile phones or in our tablets. So I think it's a good area of, of research. And that's all. If you have any question, uh, go to my, my website or find me uh, Google Pablo Cantarilla and send me an email and I will be happy to answer all your questions. So thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo, for this very comprehensive and detailed uh, talk. It was extremely informative. Any questions? Beyond the side-by-side um, -side comparison you show, were you using your own detector and extractor, or just the extractor and comparison on the... No, it was joint detector and descriptor uh, for all the methods. Because many of the people were, were in very poor lots in the same place. So, so you, did you, because you said they were able to take a number of key points, so you were limiting them. Yeah, uh, I was using the same number of key points for all the methods to, to get more like uh, uh, reliable comparisons and not to bias the results to, to a different number of key points used by different methods. These, these work on grayscale images today? Yeah, this, this, this works in, uh, in grayscale. Have yeah. you done any work on color? Uh, no, no, I've been, I've been thinking about uh, if I think uh, we can expect the same kind of, of improvements of non-linear division filtering if we apply to, to color images for, for feature detection and description. Uh, that's something maybe I would like to work in the future. Any other questions? Yes, sorry. it's not technical, but I want to know uh, with what kind of devices, sorry, those two devices. Use these kind of algorithms. Oh uh, well, um, so this work was kind of before doing in Toshiba. Uh, I've been continuing a bit of work in Toshiba. Uh, so the applications where they may use it, maybe uh, like autonomous driving or 
or uh, 3D reconstruction from mobile phones or cameras. So kind of all possible applications that, that, that we have discussed before or in surgery, all those applications where you may need to use uh, local features, it's a, it's a good algorithm to, to, to try. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, well, I would like to hear a bit more about the founded the company. company and the oh. Something about it. Yeah. Uh, maybe we can we can talk in the coffee break. Or yeah. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. I think absolutely. maybe I will need another seminar to explain the details about the startups in Spain. Uh, well, we'll find <laughs> next year for the summer. <laughs> yeah, but no, I can I can talk to you in the okay. coffee break. Yeah. Excellent. Other other questions? So, you mentioned you wanted now to, to start focusing on uh, resource constrained devices, mobile devices of different types. Yeah. What do you think the main challenges would be to bring the best or the sub best but the good uh, well, computational one, performance? One is more like computational performance, yeah. kind of from an engineering point of view. And I think the, the main challenge that, that is still for computer vision systems. Like wearable systems like uh, Google Glasses yeah. or yeah. mobile phones, is to, to produce reliable algorithms that they work in, in real life, in real environments. Yeah. Uh, like uh, dynamic scenes in the city, yeah. if you are wearing your, your glasses with a camera, yeah. how to detect features and match features reliably. Or uh, I think in the deformable case, there are still many, many open problems. Yeah. Um, Still, the, we need some time until those kind of computer vision applications will be used in, in surgery or, or doctors may be keen to, to try because you really need to, to be very accurate and very precise. And there are still many situations where, uh, where this kind of lot of features like they do not work. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? If this is not the case, then thank you again very much, Pablo, for uh, accepting and coming and looking at the uh, Intelligent Sciences Summer School. Thanks. Yeah.